Lesson 7.1 is inverse trigonometric functions. If we remember back from first semester, we talked about inverse functions, which we denote with this negative one. It looks like an exponent, but it's just our notation for inverse functions. A couple things to remember about inverse functions. If we compose an inverse function which, with its original function either direction, they essentially cancel each other out and you're left with just whatever the input was for all x's in the domain. The x and y coordinates for functions and their inverses are flipped of each other, which means that the domain of the original function is equivalent to the range of the inverse function, and the range of the original function is equivalent to the domain of the inverse function. And then the graphs of a function and its inverse are reflexive across y equals x. So now we can take that and we can build that into our trigonometric functions. So inverse trig functions undo regular trig functions. So the input is your trig ratio and the output will be your angle measurement. So if you have x equals sine of y, where y is your angle measurement and x is the corresponding ratio, then the angle measurement y is equal to the sine inverse of x. So this is how we denote sine inverse. Again, it's not sine to a negative one power. It's the, sine, the function sine inverse of x. So if we have our original trig function, because sine is not originally one-to-one, -one, we have to limit the function so that it's one-to-one -one, so that it can have an inverse trig function. So we take the original function and we limit it from negative pi over two to pi over two. So we're only looking at sine in this domain. The range is still negative one-to-one. -one. We have all of its outputs. The input is your angle measurement and your output is your y over r ratio. So then if we look at the inverse sine, then our domains and ranges are flipped. So our domains are now the negative one to one ratios and our output, our ranges, are the angle measurements from negative pi over two to pi over two. So if you look at the unit circle, we're only going to be answering for angles in the first and fourth quadrants in the unit circle. And in the fourth quadrant, because we back up and we say from negative pi over two to zero, we're going to be answering the small negative angles instead of three pi over two to two pi, the big positive angles. Your inputs for inverse trig is your y over r ratio and the output is the angle measurement. We can use the unit circle to evaluate inverse trig ratios when we have a ratio that is on our unit circle. So if we look at the first one, we have sine inverse of one. The output of an inverse trig function is an angle measurement. So I like to switch forms and think of this in terms of regular trig to help me answer these questions. So this question is asking the sine of what angle is equal to one, but only in quadrants one or four. So if we think about our unit circle, we wanna know where the sine ratio is equal to one, and that's at the top. So what angle makes sine equal one? It would be pi over two. So the sine inverse of one would be pi over two. So then the next one's the same thing. The sine inverse of zero is some angle measurement. So what angle makes sine be zero, specifically in quadrants one and four? That would be the angle measurement zero radians. So go ahead and pause the video and try the next two. Find the sine inverse of root three over two and the sine inverse of negative one half. So the sine inverse of root three over two means the sine of what angle in quadrants one and four is root three over two. Sine is always positive in the first quadrant, so that would be pi over three. And then the next one, the sine inverse of negative one half, so the sine of what angle is negative one half in quadrants one and four. Sine is negative in the fourth quadrant, and because we're doing inverse trig in the fourth quadrant, if we think about the range, it's negative pi over two to pi over two, so we have to answer it as negative pi over six. A lot of us wanna say 11 pi over six, but because of the way that we limited the domain of the sine function, which means the range of the sine inverse function, whenever we're in the fourth quadrant, we always label them as the small negative angle. We can compose trig functions with inverse trig functions, just like we've done in the past with other functions. Um, so for this first one, it says the sine inverse of the sine of pi over six. So just like before, I always work from the inside out. So the sine of pi over six is one half. And so now I have the expression, the sine inverse of one half. So if I evaluate that just like we were doing on the previous slide, that's saying the sine of what angle equals one half in quadrants one and four. It's positive, so that means I wanna be in the first quadrant, so I end up with pi over six. 
So if we notice, the sine inverse and the sine ended up canceling each other out, but that's because pi over 6, the original input, is in the range of sine inverse. So it's okay, it's an okay output for sine inverse. It's like saying the square root of 2 squared is 2. But you have to be careful because if it's not in the range, then they wouldn't cancel each other out. Like the square root of negative 2 quantity squared is not negative 2. So if I'm going to jump down to number 3 here, I'm going to go the other way. So now I have the sine of the sine inverse of negative root 3 over 2. So I'm going to do the same thing where I'm going to work from the inside out. So for the inside, I end up with the sine inverse of negative root 3 over 2, which is saying the sine of some angle in quadrants 1 and 4 is negative root 3 over 2. And so that angle would be negative pi over 3. So now the outside is saying the sine of the angle negative pi over 3 is what ratio? Well, the ratio at negative pi over 3, which is the same place as 5 pi over 3 for sine, is negative root 3 over 2. So again, these two ended up canceling each other out because negative root 3 over 2 is in the range for sine. So my outside function was sine, which means my answer was going to be a ratio, and this input ratio for sine inverse was in that range. When in doubt, always work from the inside out, and that will always work. Um, shortcuts only work some of the time. So go ahead and pause the video and try the other three. So for number two, 5 pi over 4 is not in the range of sine inverse. It's not in quadrants 1 or 4, so that's not a possible answer. So I have to evaluate from the inside out. So the sine of 5 pi over 4 is negative root 2 over 2. And then if I take the sine inverse of that, so sine of what angle in quadrants 1 or 4 is negative root 2 over 2, I end up with negative pi over 4. So for the first one with my inverse trick on the outside, pi over 6 was in the range of sine inverse, so they canceled, I just got pi over 6. For the second one, 5 pi over 4 is not in the range of my inverse trig function, so therefore I have to evaluate it from the inside out. For number 4 and 5, they're not actually on the unit circle, but you can use your properties to kind of figure them out. So for the first one, this is saying that sine of some angle is 0.8 in quadrants 1 and 4. And we don't care what that angle is, it's just some angle theta. But then the next step is saying, okay, what's the sine of that angle? Well, the sine of the angle is 0.8, therefore what's the sine of the angle? It's 0.8. And they cancel because 0.8 is in the range of the original trig function sine, which is negative 1 to 1. For the next one, it's saying the sine of the sine inverse of 1.3. Well, if I work from the inside out, the sine inverse of 1.3 is saying what angle gives me a sine of 1.3 in quadrants 1.4, and that's not possible. There is no angle that could give you a sine ratio of 1.3, so therefore it's no solution. This, this thing, there is no angle. There, the range for sine is one, negative 1 to 1. It, you will never get 1.3. So when your original trig function is on the outside, if this is not in the range, it's just not possible. It's no solution. So if we have inverse sine functions, we obviously have inverse of the other trig functions as well. So for example, if we have x equals cosine of y, where x is your cosine ratio and y is your angle measurement, then y is equal to the cosine inverse of x. In order to have an inverse, we have to make cosine 1 to 1, so we limit the domain from 0 to pi for our cosine function. So therefore, we have the entire range of negative 1 to 1. Our input is our angle measurements, and our output are our x over r ratios. So if we look at the inverse of cosine, our domain and range switch. So our do domain becomes negative 1 to 1, and our range becomes 0 to pi. So our answers, if we look on the unit circle, are going to be from quadrants 1 and 2. The input are going to be the x over r ratios, and your output are going to be your angle measurements. For tangent, if you have x as the ratio for tangent is equal to tangent of y, where y is your angle measurement, then y equals tangent inverse of x. So in order to make tangent 1 to 1, we limit it between one set of asymptotes, so from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, and the range is negative infinity to infinity, or all real numbers. Your input are your angle measurements, and your output are your y over x ratios. So for tangent of inverse of x, domain and range switch, so our domain is all real numbers. Our range is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 not included. So like sine, we're going to have angle measurements in the first and fourth quadrants, where the fourth quadrant, we're labeling them as small negative angles. And our input are going to be y over x ratios, and our output are going to be angle measurements. Our mnemonic to remember which inverse trig functions have which outputs or which ranges is sideways L. So if we write out our six trig functions 
in the order that we normally do and draw a sideways L including cosine inverse, secant inverse, and cotangent inverse, then the ones that are inside sideways L, I think of them as being more cosine based, will give you outputs in quadrants one and two. So all of the angle measurement outputs of those inverse trig functions will be between zero and pi. Cotangent inverse will not include zero and pi. For the ones that are outside sideways L, sine inverse, tangent inverse, and cosecant inverse, I think of them as being more sine based. They will give you answers in quadrants one and four. So the angle measurement answers for those inverse trig functions will be negative pi over two to pi over two. And the ones that are in the fourth quadrant, we label them as the small negative angles. So go ahead and pause the video and try evaluating these cosine and tangent inverse problems. Cosine inverse of zero means the cosine of what angle in quadrants one and two would be zero. Cosine is zero at the top, pi over two. Cosine inverse of negative root two over two means cosine of what angle in quadrants one and two is negative root two over two, so that would be three pi over four. Cosine and sine are pretty easy because it's just the x and y coordinate, so it's a little bit easier to work backwards. Tangent, cotangent, secant, and cosecant are a little bit more difficult because of their ratios. So if I look at tangent inverse of one, that means the tangent of what angle in quadrants one and four is one. Well, if tangent is one, tangent is y over x, which means your x and y coordinates have to be the same. So root two over two over root two over two for the unit circle. So therefore, my angle measurement would be pi over four. So you kind of have to work backwards to figure out what your original ratio was. Tangent inverse is negative of negative root three would mean the tangent of what angle in quadrants one and four is negative root three. If it simplified to negative root three, it would originally have been negative root three over two over one half, because y over x, and so therefore it would be negative pi over three. Here are some composite problems. Some of them use the unit circle, some of them do not. So go ahead and pause the video and try these four. So for the first one, the cosine inverse of the cosine of pi over 12 Pi over 12 is smaller than pi over 6, so it would be in the first quadrant. So they cancel each other off, even though this is not a unit circle, one that we have memorized. And the answer is pi over 12, because you're going to get some x over r ratio in the first quadrant. And then it's going to say the cosine of some angle in the first and second quadrant is that same ratio, so therefore it's the same angle. Same thing with the next one, the tangent of the tangent inverse of negative 1 half. The range for tangent is all real numbers. Negative 1 half is in that range, so therefore they cancel, you get negative 1 half because this part would say the tangent of some angle in the first and fourth quadrants would be a ratio of negative one half, and then it's gonna say, what's the ratio for that angle? So it's negative one half. For the next one, two pi over three is not in the range for tangent inverse, because this would be in the second quadrant, and the range for tangent inverse is in the first and fourth quadrants, so therefore they wouldn't cancel each other off. So I worked from the inside out. The tangent of two pi over three would be negative root three over two over one half, and then where in quadrants one and four would you get that same ratio? Well, it would be down in quadrant four because it's negative, and it would be negative pi over three. For the last one, five pi over nine is bigger than pi over two, but smaller than pi. So therefore, it'd be in the second quadrant, which is not in the range for sine inverse. So we have to figure out how to evaluate this one. We can use some things that we learned in geometry to help us with this. So five pi over nine, like I said, is gonna be over here in the fourth quadrant, and you're gonna get some y over r ratio. And you're gonna to wanna to look for an angle in either the first or fourth quadrants that end up with that same y over r ratio. So if we look in the first quadrant, because it's positive, we wanna go over to the first quadrant so we get positive, we end up with a congruent triangle here in the first quadrant. That's gonna have the same y over r ratio. So by CPCTC, we end up with congruent parts of congruent triangles. So I know that the angle that I'm looking for here is going to be congruent to this angle with my terminal side and the negative x-axis. If this full angle here is five pi over nine, then by supplementary angles, this angle here has to be four pi over nine because they have to add up to pi. So if this angle is four pi over nine, then therefore by CPCTC, the angle that I'm also looking for is also four pi over nine. So this has been an introduction to inverse trig functions, which undo regular trig functions. Your input is your trig ratios and your output are your angle measurements.